to AWARE. We are dedicated to communicating information that inspires your positive growth and change. Are you interested in a peaceful planet? Are you interested in optimal health? Are you living with purpose? Are you enjoying your life? We realize each person can make a difference, and our mission is to empower your awareness. The choices that you make in every moment shape your life, and we encourage you to realize that you have your own answers and to always listen to your own truth. We invite you to stay aware. Hi, I am Lisa Gar, and welcome to The Aware Show. This series that I have been doing with Lisa Nichols has been open, it has been honest, it has been about truth, it has been real, it has been about pain, it's been about about growth, and it means this is what it takes to have a vulnerable conversation. This is what it takes to be open. This is what it takes to transform Because at the end of the day, it actually ends up in love. And for all of the shows that we've been doing, it has been ending in that space with just a whole nother level of enormous, heart-cracking love. And I am so grateful that you are here to share this experience with me. And you've been on this journey with me during this entire series. And we're taking it to a completely different level today. So for those of you who are just joining in the series, Lisa Nichols has not only been an amazing friend for years, she has been a catalyst for transformation for me and over 30 million people on her global platform. She has reached so many with her best-selling books, Abundance Now and No Matter What, and her Motivating the Masses program and Motivating the Teen Spirit program has saved so many lives with just that program. And I am very grateful to be joined again by Lisa. Welcome, welcome. (laughs) It's great to have you here again. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about this what the conversation will birth. I'm excited to have it with you. I love you dearly. I love your entire family dearly. And so um, what what better place than to have a necessary series of conversations that will lead to necessary action. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And we are also joined by another incredible guest who is also all about acknowledging pain and transforming it into growth, which is what his book called Inquire Within is all about. National Poetry Slam champion in Q was also named as Oprah's Super Soul 100 list of the world's most influential thought leaders, and also being the first spoken word artist to form with Cirque du Soleil, which must have been incredible. And Inq is joining us today. I am so grateful that you are here. Thank you so much for being with us, Inq. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, as art imitates life, I wanted to invite NQ on today to share with us an absolutely incredible moving poem that is, and I will, I will pre-warn you, this is intense. It's intense. And that's why I wanted to open the show with this, because of the level of awareness that it cracks open. So this poem is called Dear White American, Americans, Dear White Americans, and Whenever you are ready, bring us in. Thank you, NQ. How do we talk about the problems without feeding them? If we ignore them, we most likely keep repeating them. If we explore them, we run the risk of reinforcing them. So how then do we get down to the source of them? Dear white Americans, Imagine if the roles were reversed and white people were enslaved by black people first. And for almost 300 years, they forced us into work and they beat us, raped us and tortured us. And then they went to church and they treated us like dirt and they chained us and they whipped us and they told us we were cursed and they sold us on the auction blocks like that was what we're worth. And they outlawed us to read or write or vote. But what was worse, they would hang us by our necks so that witnesses could look and see our bodies slowly swaying from a tree like a fruit. Imagine what that took. 
if generations passed before the melting pot could cook, and our nation had to go to war before we closed the book. But freedom wasn't peaceful. It was as brutal as it looked. Segregation isolated us because of how we looked, and neighborhoods were separate. We educated separate. We congregated, dated, mated, ate, and drank separate. They made us travel separate. They made our toilets separate. The hospitals were separate. The telephones were separate. They made our pools separate. They made our parks separate. And when it wasn't separate, they would split us into sections so that they would get the best seats while we would get the worst. I want you to imagine if the history reversed that we were the ones terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan and a pointy white hood hunted down the white man and police would beat us daily without any repercussions. See, the justice system's blind, but only to its own corruption. So people started demonstrating, marching and protesting. We couldn't take it any longer. We had had enough. And when enough people have enough, the people have the power. So a coalition joined the fight, but civil rights was ours. And the boycotts were ours. And the sit-ins were ours. And the riots were ours. And the leaders were ours. And when our leaders lost their lives, the grief was also ours. So we raised our fists and conscious militants to be empowered, and America was moving at a million miles an hour, but we'd taken strides politically to even out the powers. Now, educated whites could become lawyers or professors, doctors or directors, bankers or investors, but mostly our jobs were still industrial in nature. So when they closed the factories, they didn't need our labor. And this affected more than just the money in our wallets because areas that once were working class became impoverished. Imagine how that felt to be unable to provide, to look your children in the eyes without a nine to five. So families were broken and neighborhoods were broken and liquor stores were open and gun stores were open. And drugs were on the rise, but the reasons were unspoken. And gangs were on the rise, but the reasons were unspoken. And while pop culture painted us as being dumb or dangerous, we struggled to survive inside a system that was blaming us. And still somehow we thrived out of all of that upheaval to amplify the unheard voices of our people. But imagine all the unheard voices of our people. Imagine if you didn't have to imagine that you weren't treated equal. Imagine the resentment you would have against the system if white males were disproportionately cycled into prisons. Imagine your aggression. If people were afraid of you because of your complexion, if strangers crossed the street when you were walking their direction just because of their suspicion, imagine your suspicion. If when you talked about it, other races didn't listen. In fact, they made you wrong for even bringing up oppression. Their perception was for you to stop acting like a victim. Imagine the disconnection. Then finally, a white person wins the presidential election. And half the country celebrates this symbol of progression, but the other half is moving in the opposite direction. So the next president we elect is a blatant racist. We still have unacknowledged privilege, still voting rights restrictions, still bias cops on traffic stops and widespread division from those poverty stricken to those making decisions, still uneven nutrition, underfunded education, Still job discrimination, still home discrimination, still loan discrimination, still pay discrimination, still dealing with that normal everyday discrimination. And Michael Brown was white, and Trayvon Martin was white, and Freddie Gray was white, and Eric Garner was white, and Oscar Grant was white, and Sandra Bland was white, and Stephon Clark was white, and Ahmaud Arbery was white. And Breonna Taylor was white. And George Floyd was white. And so were countless others. Yet our country wants us to believe that racism is over. 
Wow. In Q, how and when did you write this? Um, I wrote this a few years ago after the Freddie Gray incident. And um, un unfortunately, it's uh, more applicable to this moment yeah. than when I wrote it. Um, and, you know, I mean, as a white man, if you write something about race, which I've been writing about race for years, you're inherently going to get a part of it wrong. And you know that because um, it has to be imagined. It's not something that I've experienced. It comes from a place of empathy and it comes from a place of compassion and trying to have the most understanding that I can. But I know that a part of it will be naive. Um, and yet I don't write from a place of strategizing my inspiration. You know, in general, I think if you strategize your inspiration, you're one step away from manipulation. And if you're manipulating mm -hmm. your audience, you're manipulating yourself first. So I write when I'm inspired or I write when I'm moved or I write when I'm really angry. And this piece came out of uh, that rage that I was feeling. And I'm willing to partially get it wrong in order to join the conversation because, um, you know, this is a black problem in terms of they have to feel the pain from it. But it's really an American problem and we all have to be a part of the solution and sitting on the sidelines is not acceptable. Right. And having these types of uncomfortable, interconnected conversations is cellularly changing for me. And Lisa, I wanted to know your feelings as he was reading that, because I've heard it and every time I hear it differently. Um, I didn't listen to it before you sent me the link um, because I wanted to hear it for the first time from him. And so HQ, uh, NQ, I, I apologize. You are, um, your awareness is a breath of fresh air. And your acknowledgement of what you will get from sheer passion, anger, and what you won't get right because you don't have the experience is refreshing as well. Um, I am I'm checking myself at the level of emotion that I have right now um, because it's almost like I equated it the other day. It's like a, a child being molested for 12 years and mama keeps dismissing it because mama really wants the boyfriend. And then 10 years after it, it's happened, 15 years after mama goes, oh, you know what? I, I think you were right. Part of me is grateful that you got it. The other part is going for 12 years. I had to go through this because because you just didn't see it because it wasn't convenient to see it. So my level of emotion is is in the OK, so. I, I've been called sister, so I've been called a lot of things, <laughs> um, a lot of really great things and a lot of things that that were in connection to my level of conversation about what wasn't right, you know, starting when I was 18 called Sister Soldier. And I was made to feel guilty my freshman year in college because every time in this all white college, someone would make a joke and, and it was a derogatory joke and they made it out of ignorance because they hadn't been raised around African-Americans. I would just raise my hand and go, by the way, you know, that's a derogatory joke. And, you know, you can say it, but give me the respect of me not being around. And I remember getting the most heat from the black people, um, the students saying, man, you're gonna make it hard for us to fit in. They're not gonna want us to come around. And I remember just saying, that's not okay. Like we have to be willing to have some level of inconvenience to help our white brothers and sisters understand. And when I would bring it up, I would bring it up like, I just, you know, you seem nice. I, I, I like you. I want to just let, I want to be your friend. So I got to tell you, you can't do that. And so um, there's always this conversation and I appreciate you and Q for saying, I don't know. There's this conversation as a, as a black person for me, I, I, I love speak for me as a black woman to go, am I wrong for, for holding people accountable in the way that I want them to hold me accountable? And so your poem in your words, it's, it's more than a poem. It's, 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 it's an acknowledgement. It's, it's an installation of ownership. It's, 
It's this beautiful piece of humanity. Whether you be white, Asian, Latino, black, is saying, hold on, we are one race. We might be different nationalities, but we are one race, the human race. Hold me accountable to my part here. And let's just do some role playing and take you out of those shoes and put you in those shoes as the human race. How would that feel? You know, and um, like I found myself while you were speaking, I've never in my days thought, hmm, let's just for a moment just change places. I, I, I hadn't thought about that because it's been so removed that a white person would ever be anywhere close to this experience. And also, I was just listening to my brother from another mother, Reverend Michael Beckwith, and um, he was saying that um, through a study, I don't know the study, so I won't try to quote it, but under all of the things that African Americans have experienced, it, 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 it's, it's absolutely unknown how we've succeeded. Right. When you look at all the things stacked up and I was listening to that going hmm, and, and he equated it to all that happened to the American Indians and how it's driven them to the um, reservations and how it's driven them to the horrific experience in some cases, in many cases that they have. And I, I heard that just kind of sitting with it. And then when you just repeated it in a different way, it landed on me to go. While there's a great weight, there's a great possibility. And, um, and movement happens when the hidden can no longer be hidden. The unspoken is now the standard conversation. Um, the tolerated and the accepted, the ignored and the overlooked cannot be tolerated, will not be tolerated, cannot be accepted, and will no longer be overlooked. So while this journey here has felt to the African-American culture, which is where you hear all the rage, and I appreciate, brother, you saying, I write, because I'm a poet as well. I, I don't do a lot of public poetry because in my poetry, it's literally all passion first. <laughs> it's, it's all passion and it's all energy. And I'm writing a piece right now um, with a black man and a white man, and I'm letting it come out. It, you're you're going to appreciate the piece. It is the it is the the cousin to what you're what you just did. And 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 I, I can't I'm, I can't wait to hear that. I no, would love I, I literally would love to hear it. I know I, I might give you the sample before it hits the public, just out of honoring the art. And what you do, and 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 if it's okay with you, uh, I want to gift these two men with your words um, in whatever form I, I'll forward to them, because um, I, it, it's it's a poem to dear white America, actually. So it's not written for um, the African American or the people of color. It's written for the conscious white brothers and sisters. It's written for. Uh, Lisa, it's written for you. It's written for our brothers and sisters that are saying, no, no, uh, show me what I don't see. You know, let me, let me pull out of my blind spot what's been in my blind spot. I didn't even know yes. it was in my spot. And so yes. that's, what, that's what your poem is doing. But your poem does something a little different. And you have a luxury that I don't have. And, and racism is going to end with you doing something, you and Lisa. Um, it, it, you're, we're going to hold hands, but my part isn't to end racism, your part. Because when you, as you were speaking, I said, my God, they're going to hear him different because they're not going to try to label him an angry black man. They're not going to angry ang label him an angry black woman. He gets to be an angry white man. But because he's an angry white man, let me listen a little closer. Let me hear what he's saying and so um i i salute you i honor you i i'm i'm excited to hold hands beside you and and and, and I, we're at the beginning we're at the beginning you know i think we'll look back 20 years from now as we're talking about what happened in 2020 and what happened in 2021 and 2022 you know when i study dr king and i study nelson mandela and i study them i i i read off the years as if it were nothing. Oh, so in 68, he did this. 
oh, and, and, and then in, in 70 did this and, and, and Nelson Mandela. And now I realize, oh, that was 365 days of full court press grind. It wasn't just a moment in time. It wasn't just a read. And so we'll look at this 20 years from now and for the next five years, um, we'll just we'll, we'll we'll be getting the infrastructure in place, and so I I, I thank you. I I'm, yes. I uh, I'm on the way, I, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your willing to speak the truth, um, no matter how painful. I'm grateful for your willingness to be inconvenienced with the disruption of anger and frustration and hurt you know, to find solution. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you're willing to call out the truth. Yes, yes. And, and that has, the unspoken is spoken. And you help facilitate that in Q. We've been facilitating that on this show, but it needed to have just a, a totally different, another level. We can't just talk. We have to transform through words. We have this medium right now. And until we can get together and hug and, and love on each other again, we have this right now where we get to use, and we're watching, everybody's watching. Yeah. And so uh, I, uh, I thank you. I just want to Go say ahead. real quick, there, there, first of all, Lisa, both Lisa's, thank you very much for what you said. But Lisa Nichols, I really appreciate everything that you said and it resonates with me. And, um, you know, your work is transformative. So hearing that from you as well, uh, you know, I, I'm letting it in. And I, I thank yeah. you for that. Um, I think that there's different levels of, of privilege. I mean, you obviously have people that are completely racist. You know, somebody tore down a um, Frederick Douglass statue I just read today. So you're, you're having um, a whole segment of the population that believe in the illusion of their superiority, which actually makes them inferior if you think about it. But um, then you have another population that acknowledges the situation that we're all in, that maybe they do have privilege, um, but they have the luxury to not think about it all the time. They go back into their normal routines and they forget about it. And um, so if you're uncomfortable right now, congratulations. Everyone should be very uncomfortable right now. You know, it's necessary. And uh, I think if, if we stop looking at the discomfort um, from a lens of negativity and look at it from the lens of positivity, there's no possibility that comes out of that. I was hiking the other day and I literally saw a caterpillar and it was like crossing. This isn't one of my normal shticks, by the way, that I do in shows. I really was hiking like two days ago and a caterpillar was in the middle of the hiking trail and I like stopped and I looked at it for a while and I was just kind of tripping out in my own mind about the knowledge that I know it's going to transform into a butterfly and maybe it doesn't even know that yet you know I don't know that it has that sense of self-awareness of where it's headed but um the idea that it was yeah. probably really painful um and I think that this uh historical unacknowledgement um mm -hmm. of what our history really is in terms of how we're taught, um, in terms of right and wrong, we're not really taught to have context. Um, uh, this is the moment for us all to be brought into the reality of where we come from so that we can create the type of future that we want together to live in as Americans. Well, thank you for your contribution to this conversation in Q. You brought us to a whole nother level and we appreciate you. And I'm just so, honored that this connection happened this way, Lisa, for your openness and vulnerability. I sat with this for days and days, and I was trying to figure out how this was going to work and how, you know, because I orchestrate the show in my mind, and I had just kept praying, and I, I just knew that God would take care of this, that this would unfold the way that it needed to unfold, and maybe you two can continue on your dialogue as well. Thank you so thank much, you. thank you. I so Lots appreciate you. Lots of love, everybody. You. Wherever you are in the world. <laughs> I want to say this. Bye. I want to get the recording, and I am going to personally push it out on every single one of my platforms multiple times so that at 
everyone, the, the, the millions of people that I read can experience your truth um, so that we can begin to build the bridge and move from anger and anguish into some form of collective action um, because you represent and you're a stand for that. And so uh, I'm excited to connect your work with my tribe, with my community um, uh, on a global level. Uh, and I, I wanna look for, for opportunities for us to uh, play together and call it work, uh, create art together, create consciousness together, create awareness together, create disruption together. I'm okay with disruption. I mean, all the great changes on the planet occurred right after a disruption occurred. <laughs> so um, to be willing to have that. And, and I, I want you to know uh, you will see your face on, on every single form of connection that I have to the world and this message. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you both very much. And I, I look forward to building more with both of you soon. Enjoy the rest Aww. of this and much love. Love you. Thank you. Oh, man. I'm, see, I'm crying again. It happens every show with you. <laughs> that was a beautiful yeah. synchronicity. And I want to actually carry this conversation on about this divisiveness because COVID is dividing us. It, it, the, the racism conversations, the political, I mean, we are in more of a divisive conversation than I've ever seen, Lisa. It's getting inc incredibly... Ah, oh, I just, it, not disturbing, it's dangerous. It's dangerous well, because of the belief systems are really locked in and it's polarizing further and further. Are you noticing this? Um, it, it is, and, and the belief systems were there before all of this, right? So let's, and I don't want to Pollyanna this, I don't want to sugarcoat it, um, but we need change. We need change. And oftentimes we don't want to have the disruption that precedes the change to the degree that it's required. Um, you know, I flew home from uh, the Bahamas recently and everything was so clear. And so, I mean, everything was so clean. Everything was clean. And I, I said, we'll never go back to the flippant way that it that we were before around our hygiene we're just and, and when i say hygiene i mean hygiene as a human race not personal hygiene but in in the cleanliness and on the airplane that i was on there was a thing on the screen that says just so you know these surfaces were all clean with this cleanser before you got on and i thought wow that makes me feel good um i think that there are gifts that are coming wrapped in sandpaper right now there are gifts so our level of hygiene, our level of awareness, our level of consciousness, um, our level of immune building and in, in, intentionality now, right? And so don't miss all of those gifts that came around. We, we don't want the sandpaper called COVID-19, but there is something coming through it. We just have to be committed to get to the other side. Politically, I, I think one of the biggest things that are going to happen politically is people who didn't vote will not sleep on voting again. Because what I just said the other day to a few people, I said, if you didn't vote, you helped put the current political climate in office. So don't complain if you didn't vote. So not voting and not speaking is like speaking. When you say nothing, you say something, right? And so even in this climate, um, you, you are being forced to make a stand for what you believe. And Dr. King says, stand for something or fall for anything. And so you're forced to make a stand where so many people felt like, ah, my vote don't matter. Ah, it's not my business. I don't care. And many of those people are people of color because they felt like it didn't matter. Well, of course, if you have in a political climate and then in a race climate right now, now you get to see whatever. Not only do Black Lives Matter, my vote matter, I matter, my opinion matters. And so I, it, it, is a, it is a beautiful, ugly collision of wake up and own. And for white people, it's wake up and own the amount of unconscious privilege or conscious privilege. Wake up and own that this thing called racism that you don't believe in, you, you don't believe in it, it's not going to end with you acting as if it doesn't exist. So we tried that for the last 50, unconsciously or consciously. That's not working now. And so you have all this disruption, all this discomfort, all this unexpected spaciousness, 
I can't hug. I can't go visit. We just had holiday weekend. And it's the smallest celebration my family has ever had because every family celebrated within themselves, right? Amongst themselves. Okay. So there's unexpected spaciousness. We have all of this time. And I truly believe, Lisa, that depending on who you choose to be now, and there's a word that I want I want to say, and I want people to write down, and, and Reverend Beckwith said this, if you're growth-centric right now, if you're growth-centric right now, then you'll be willing to be uncomfortable with what NQ said. If you're growth-centric right now, you'll be willing to ask, what was I unaware of? Growth-centric is the desire to grow to the best version of you in each season. Growth-centric says, I want to move the human race forward, even to my own possible discomfort. That's Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, Mother Teresa, you know, Nelson Mandela. That's growth centric. They weren't, they weren't black centric, Latino centric. They weren't Buddhist centric. They were growth centric for humanity. And so when that is the case, then you go, okay. It's all causing us to absolutely push ourselves every in every way. You've got to be awake, though, in order to be pushed. And, and I understand that the beginning of an awakening is shocking, jarring, because you realize you've been asleep. It's embarrassing. It's, it's, it, you want to just go hide back in your grave. And I get that. I get that completely. And then comes the that chrysalis as in he was saying when you start to break through that outer layer and say okay there's got to be another way i mean this is happening to many of us financially with uh, with covid and i'm i have another company in the entertainment industry that's been completely shut down it went from mock 100 to zero and the entertainment industry is struggling with how to get people back together and and it's there's many, many, many people who are not going to recover from the COVID shutdown. It's and it, it, it's a long term yeah. change. It's a long term mm -hmm. change. And I, I think one of the thing, things that are happening is that um, we are uh, being forced to um, we're being forced to sit still. Uh, we're being forced to reinvent ourselves. We're being forced to pivot on the pivot and the pivot. Um, there's no end date in sight. Like it's going to be over on September one, you know. So oh no! We're, oh no! <laughs> we're not used to the known, and so we we are now um, we are now required to live parked between fluid and flexible. We're now required to um, to pick up the gavel called reinvention of self. Mm -hmm. um, we're now required to be still. Uh, and look at how what we've been busy with, because some of us have been so busy being busy being busy that we haven't been still to hear our spiritual voice, our intuitive voice. We haven't been quiet enough to hear our relational desires. We haven't been quiet enough to hear our bodies say, thank you. I've been needing eight hours of sleep for 10 days. Not I needed to rest. Yes, yes. So we've been so busy and we're resistant of it because it's not our norm. But let me just tell you, in every great uh, uh, collapse of one empire is the opportunity to rebuild another. And I'm not saying this to sound Pollyanna. I'm not saying I'm saying this because I I remain, as Reverend uh, Dr. Beckwith says, growth centric to go hold on. As, as horrific as this is, and I don't want to minimize the discomfort, I don't want to minimize the pain, I don't want to minimize the anger that I've had, the sadness that I've had, how my heart has cried more now than it's cried in the last 10 years. My heart is crying for, for all that I'm saying. My heart is crying when they pull down the Frederick Douglass statue. My heart cries when I hear that a group of protesters got sprayed uh, by a, a, a car full of guys, uh, yeah. white who shot paintballs at them. I, my heart cries that we are still here, but I choose to live in possibility because of the mantle that I've chosen to pick up, because of my assignment, because what I take to be here is my charge while I'm here. People have different charges, but my charge while I'm here is to be about the highest level, not perfect, 
put the highest level of consciousness possible. Now, that doesn't mean I won't try to, I, I won't shake the truth. And this truth right now is an ugly truth. It's an ugly truth for everyone involved. For you, it's almost like these, th this, this haze is lifted and now you see clarity and clear, right? Um, and now this exposure is occurring and you're saying, well, why didn't I know about that? How did I miss that? So you have to be willing to not sit in a lot of personal judgment, sit in ownership. Please sit in mm -hmm. ownership. Because yes. if you can own, if you can own that you were walking in some areas of your life very awake and walking in some areas of your life very asleep, you won't ever go asleep again. So I need you to own that. Because when yes. you own that, you're more powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I don't, you know, I don't need you to own it from a blame or a shame perspective. I don't want you to own it because I want you to hurt. I want you to own it because I want you to be empowered with the way that we can stop this and make sure it never happens in our children's future life and in their children's life, that we can change the trajectory. Somehow the way Nelson Mandela said he was gonna do something and Dr. King said he was gonna do something, Lisa and Lisa and everyone watching get to say, we're gonna do something. Yes, yes, and that I and I believe that the path has been paved before us for this moment to never go back again. And we talked about this in the last show that we will end racism in our lifetime. And that is absolutely incredible. And I want to speak to that level of possibility, Lisa, because you are so amazing at helping us move into a place of what is possible where do we go from here not that it is over at all of us becoming awake we are just at the beginning of it but i've asked you this before is our relationships and and i'm going to talk about you and i are are amazing but let's talk about on a global scale of our relationships with our black and our white brothers and sisters coming together in equality what that looks like. And you were putting together um, five steps for a long-term systemic change that you mentioned last time. I'm not going to expect you to call those up, but I, I know that you're really working on this conversation. And I am. if you could share. Absolutely. So, um, so I'm, I'm putting together a long-term plan and we're, we're, we're in several phases and, and you know, phase one um, was really to uh, stop the bleeding, and I, 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 I don't say that lightly. And phase one is the million letter movement. And to, uh, to, to get a level of justice, acceptable justice, now that we've exposed and put the light on the challenge. And so the million letter movement has already launched. It launched four weeks ago. It's gonna go for 10 weeks. And those are pre-developed letters that we're sending out and anyone can go to million letter um, movement uh, camp, uh, dot com our uh, million letter campaign go on my facebook uh, page and see it and so that's a major part of part one is, is stop the bleeding right you can't think straight until you have oxygen you know if, if someone's holding your head underwater nothing else matters until you get air so that's the first part is to say help us breathe meaning Let's regulate and mandate as a community. So to my white brothers and sisters, this million letter campaign is for all of us. And, um, and we need you. We need you to go, let me pick the state. The letter is pre-developed. It has statistics. It's already done. So that's phase one. What else is in phase one is education. And so when you have things like NQs, poetry. What a great piece of work of education. The other part mm -hmm. is yesterday I was the guest speaker on, oh, this is so beautiful, on a young man, his name is Nicholas Walker. And I, I, I really think that, that if it works for you to interview him, it will be beautiful. Nicholas Walker is a young African-American male. I think he's about 22 years old. He just graduated from USC last month. And mm -hmm. he he wanted to be a part of the social justice change, but realized as an African-American young adult millennial, he didn't know enough 
He didn't know what can I do. I don't know enough about the history. It's not taught in any form of education. Mm. You got a couple of paragraphs on slavery. Like it's so undereducated. To, and, and to NQ's point, it's ill education as well. And so he realized that he wasn't educated as an African American young man. And so he picked up a stack of books just in the last three months to say, I need to read. Then he began to talk to other um, young adults, African Americans primarily, and saying, what do you know about like this whole issue that they're talking about? And a lot of those didn't know. So now he has a book club of 50 African American young adults who are all reading about the journey. They're reading Malcolm X, they're reading Sojourner of Truth, they're just reading stuff to go, where do we go? And then they're interviewing individuals to, um, to learn. So you're creating CCC, Cultural Courageous Conversations. Yes. Conversation. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a, a beautiful collision of intention between black and whites. And when you hear black people talking about their experience, what they're really asking you is white brother, white sister, please see me. And so when mm. NQ starts, when NQ starts with, I don't know what it's like to be you. I'm just going to do, I'm going to get some things wrong. Who? what he does is he, he dismisses the need for me to help him to see me. That's huge. Oh, that has got to be, yes. It's not your responsibility for him to get it. Yes. And he, yes, absolutely said that. You know, we were talking about the last time we were about this question of, can you trust me with your unfiltered truth? You said that the last time. <laughs> that was you. <laughs> can I tell you, I've been saying that a lot in my private time as I'm writing this piece of poetry. Because, and I'm going to say something to you, you know, this is our safe space. Um, but there are very few occasions, very few, Lisa, when a black person is around a white person and we're not on the inside filtering our truth, our words, mm. our experience to make sure, get this, that it's palatable and digestible for you. For me. We yeah. have learned, we have learned how when we're in your presence, let's adjust to calibrate to such a degree that you can you can handle it, which is why we would straighten our hair because when we first would step into a business that had whites in it and our hair was curly, it was unacceptable because you weren't used to that. So then came the flat iron, then came the relaxed, then came the weaves that changed our hair just so that we could be more acceptable to you. When we speak, in your presence. We adjust our language so that you can understand it, which is why sometimes when black people are around, they go, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in mixed company. I don't want to be any white. I just want to, cause then we don't have to adjust filter. some of our work. Mm -hmm. We don't have to filter it. And, and it's not about a, a withhold. It literally is an adjustment so that you feel comfortable. I've wow. done it for years. I've done wow. it for years. It's why the conferences, some that you and I go to together, yes. it's why in some cases it could be much more exhausting for me to be there than for you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I'm constantly uh, you adjusting. Know, you're con I, I, thank you. I mean, this was the, the right way to bring this whole conversation about because I, we have, during this opportunity of this hour together, I've put myself in your shoes just from the very moment I heard that poem last week from NQ and knew that this was right for this show I you are continuing to allow me to do that to put myself in the African-American shoes lens eyes and listen and hear from that perspective and I right. love that I honestly do I really do well I do. Well, when I, 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 I know, I know you do sincerely. You, you have to, you have to earn, I, I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm, I, I'm not speaking for every African-American, but I'm speaking for the vast majority oh. <laughs> that as a white sister or brother, 
You have to earn our trust to show you our unfiltered truth so that it's palatable for you to go. Can I just, if I let my hair down the way you let your hair down, because you've never really seen my hair down. I keep my hair up because you've told me and you've showed me in so many different ways, whether it's being locked out of the boardroom, whether there's been one black person hired for every 10 white person hired, whatever it's been, you've shown me. And I say you, I mean society. Yeah. You've shown me. You've shown me that I I need to act a certain way to be included into what's called mainstream. Number one, why do we call it mainstream? We call it mainstream because you're it's yours. It's not, it's yours. That's why we call it mainstream. But really, if it's the human race, then then all streams should count. All streams should count. But in order to be included in mainstream, there's a way of being, operating, speaking. There's a way of showing up and it, and we've always done that for your benefit. When I say, if you have to earn our trust to go, Mm -hmm. Lisa, what would you do? What would you do if my color was an issue? How would you say it? How would you be? What would you wear? How would you speak? Can, Can you trust me enough to just do that? And then let me, me, your white brother, me, your white sister, let me expand my capacity to be able to take all of you in unedited, unfiltered, unmodified. Unapologetically. Mm-hmm. Unapologetically. Yes. yes, 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 it does. It absolutely does. And it's what I want to be a part of. I mean, this is, this is, this is the conversation that I want to be a part of. And and have been. Yeah. It's not just this conversation. I mean, this is how I live my life. I, I, and I'm not going to sit here and bore you with how that looks, but it is, it is how I live my life. And you know that. And so when we're talking about a bigger picture here in our, in our society and how we are in, God, I can't even believe I'm using the word integrating. That's not even... <sighs> How do we have a more inclusive experience in the boardroom, on media, in films, on television shows, on announcers, broadcasters? It's happening, and I see this happening, but is it happening enough in your mind? Is it happening enough? Well, first you said, how do we do it? First, I I want you to feel that disgust that you just felt when you said integrate. I mean, really, this... I want you to not push it aside. I want it to piss you off. I want it to make you enough is enough. I want it because you have to get to that level of conviction because integrating, because that's you, that's the right word. I I, 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 embarrassed that it needs to be, but when you have a room of 10 and there's a quota that no more than two black people can be in that room, but it's an unspoken quota, we still got, we, we got work to do, right? And, and, and I'm just using uh, that. Right. You no, know, I so live, and I, I'm sorry, when I was, when I was eight, I lived in a neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio, and they had, now this was when I was eight. They started an integration and that's what triggered for me. They started an integration program. So I don't know my, how this worked because I was really, really young, but I remember that we had the, every other house was a different color in, in our neighborhood. And that's what I grew up with. And I learned later that it was a program that was initiated. My mom told me uh, that 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 had happened and I didn't know any, you know, any different. And so when I just said that word, it just triggered me because that was how I grew up and didn't notice any difference until it was told to me later. And so it just triggered me. Yeah, that just lit me up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm not sorry. I, I, I think, yeah, no, I get it. And, and I wanted to pause on that being lit up so that yeah. we didn't b- yeah. pass it because that's what Thank the you. march in the street is. But let me explain something to everyone that's listening that still um, has some challenges understanding why is it happening the way it is. The anger that you see, um, and, and if you ask the question, why does everyone need to be so angry? Um, um, it's because we're exhausted. Yeah. It's because we're exhausted. And so the filters are down. 
we're exhausted from the stories our grandparents tell us and the fact that we could tell them the same story now. We're exhausted. So I'm not justifying, I'm explaining so we understand. So you see exhaustion. Um, and, and then you see filters down because of COVID-19, right? And so yes, it's the, yes. it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, it's the pressure cooker that it happened within, right? Not discounting that there isn't real reason to be angry. Um, it's the, it's the, I'm grateful you're on board now. Why did we have to lose so many? I'm right. not looking for yeah. justification for this. I'm just, I'm just giving you, I'm giving you a very real reason why you're seeing the prolonged anger, why you're seeing, why you're seeing people's rationale be thrown out of the window when they think I could actually catch COVID-19 if I'm out here protesting, right? It's why people aren't just looting. Now there's some people who are, who are looting because they're opportunists and we're not saying that that's okay. We're not saying that that's justified. And, and I don't ever want to use the death of George Floyd or the death of anyone or anything in the Black Lives Matter or anything in the Latino movement or the Asian movement or the white movement as a reason and excuse for someone to loot and dismantle someone else's business or hurt and right. harm someone. So I don't justify that. But what I am saying is that if it seems like there's a fury and there's an anger and it's hard to understand the why, it's because there's years and years of cellular pain and there's years and years of silent adjustment. There's years and years from me. And, and I, 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 I haven't experienced being beaten or being pulled over. Uh, being, I haven't experienced any of that, but if I, I, I won't, I won't labor you with what I have experienced because every African-American would nod their hands that I know what she's talking about. And, mm -hmm. and what you would do is just try your best to understand intellectually. But what I'm telling you is that it's a cellular. So I'm just explaining why that fury is to that degree. It's not to shame you, but it is to ask you, can you own your part in us being here. Because if you can own Lisa, and I say this to all my white brothers and sisters, if you can own that, and I don't want you to sit in shame long and sit, I don't want to, I'm not going to sit in blame long, but I do want you to sit in ownership because when you sit in ownership, you now grab the steering wheel of our future because the same ownership that said, all right, we got here because not, a, not enough of us got angry. Not enough of us got vocal. Right. Not enough of right. us took a stand. Right. That same ownership is the steering wheel that will drive us through the next 10 years of change. And so you can't hold the steering wheel on where we're going if you don't hold the steering wheel on how we got here. And so that's why right. you see all the historical stuff coming up. That's why you see all of the names being led. In the moment, as our white brothers and sisters, you do an NQ in, a, in your own way and go, ah, okay, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me just stop. Let me stop defending. Yes. You, you don't have to defend anything because it's not, a, it's not against you. It's against racism. It's against yes, yes. systematic racism. It's not against, it, we not in a fight. We're not in a fight. And we, and sometimes you can forget that. And then we get into a fight. And then when we get into a fight, it's difficult to get out because we've distilled it down to me and you. Let's keep it high consciousness and go, hold on. You and I together, let's fight that. Yes, yes. That's where the true healing begins. And I do believe healing has begun, Lisa. I do believe we are very, very much at the beginning of it. But this is the this is I the conversation where yes, yes, and healing Lisa, has when begun. You can have a white man, when you can have a white man like NQ sit and move a black woman like Lisa Nichols with that piece of ownership, you can't tell me oh. we're not moving, but what you have to be willing to do is being it for the long haul. This is not, this is not a fad. This is not a fad. And, and, and it's going to get exhausting. And, and, and it's going to get more frustrating. 
And it's going to feel like we should have gotten there by now. And, and I'm mm. saying that to white Americans. We've this already is going to take time. No, this is going to take time. This is going to take time. Yes. And this is good time. Well, I love you and I thank you. And I, I'm so excited about uh, the connection you made with NQ. That was, a, that was out on a limb for me. And you, of course, embraced everything. And I love you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And to all our wonderful, incredible listening friends, please check out the millionlettermovement.com. This is essential. I've sent letters. You have to do the same. It's absolutely essential. And, um, and look, you'll learn a lot about it. Culturally creative conversations. Yeah, culturally creative conversations. Is that what you said? So, so what we're calling them is uh, cultural courageous conversation, CCC. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, and, and what it is is the <laughs> opportunity to create um, intimate proximity. So, so the whole convert, yes. so I'm going to do, I'm going to do a series of things around intimate cultural proximity. So conversations are the beginning next year. When we're out of this season, I'm actually going to do trainings where I have the same number of whites, the same number of blacks, the same number of Latins, and the same number of Pacific Islanders or in Asian. And we're going to have like literally just all these things that create this awareness. We're going to bump up against our isms. We're going to bump up against yeah. our biases. So this is the beginning of literally a, a, a phenomenal movement called cultural intimate proximity which leads to training, awareness, and consciousness. This is your new piece, isn't it, Lisa? It, 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 and it's birthing. It's just coming out. I'm not yes, trying to, it's I not a strategy. It. I love what I you said. It. It's not a strategy. It's being born. I'm yep. just midwifing it out. I'm midwifing it out. It. I'm watching it. Um, and so, yeah, it's yep. going to be disruptive. It's going to be bumpy, and it's going to be some of the most beautiful work any of us could ever do. I see it. I absolutely see it. I see it. I see it. Well, we've got a lot to talk about in the next show. Thank you so much, Lisa Nichols. You are a blessing. A blessing. I love you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you, for, thank you for your courageousness. You said you went out on a limb. And let me just tell you, change will happen on the skinny branch only. <laughs> Yep. Yep. You got to be ready to fall. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you. And until next time, I invite you to stay aware. Thank you.